This video is sponsored by War Thunder. If you've ever played a video game before, then you'll definitely recognize this guy. This is Gabe Null, CEO of Valve Corporation and funny internet man who has his very own subgenre of outdated internet memes. Gaben. But Gaben is more than just a pretty face. He co-founded one of the largest gaming companies in the world, and he's been in charge of it ever since. And perhaps most importantly, he is the father of Steam the biggest gaming platform in the world and the largest monopoly the gaming industry has ever seen. But in recent years, Gabe Null's decision making has come into question because Valve's reputation has been dwindling. And a lot of people who were once diehard fans of Valve and their work are now becoming disillusioned with the company they once loved. So today, I wanted to recount the rise and fall of Valve Corporation. Talk about exactly how Valve became who they are today and talk about how modern Valve has changed and whether they changed for the better or for the worse. But before we can talk about modern Valve, we of course have to talk about old Valve and where it all started. Valve came from very humble beginnings. Two guys who worked at Microsoft had the bright idea to leave their jobs and make their very own company. A games company. Mike Harrington and Gabe Newell quit their jobs at Microsoft in 1996 to go make their dream a reality and they founded Valve. But there was just a tiny problem with this, just one small issue. None of them had any experience whatsoever in designing a video game. Gabe had worked on a Windows 95 port of the original Doom whilst working at Microsoft, but that was the extent of his game development experience. So their first port of call was to hire some employees. And bear in mind, it was 1996, so you couldn't just go down to your nearest university and ask for game design students. Gaming was a very niche field that was constantly changing, and there were only a tiny handful of companies that made games that were even barely profitable at all. So if you wanted to hire game devs, you needed to think outside the box. So Gabe and Mike did something big that would go on to define their entire future as a company. They hired modders. They found a bunch of hobbyist game devs that made mods for other games, and they sent them job offers to come work at Valve. Jan Bernier was a chemistry major who became an IP lawyer, but he was also responsible for developing a level editor for the original Quake in his free time called BSP. And according to Gabe himself, Jan Bernier was responsible for writing more lines of code for Half-Life than any other developer in the entire company. Steve Bond had worked with a friend John Gus three to make a bunch of Quake mods, and even a popular website at the time called Quake Command. But Steve Bond's day job was being a manager at a Waffle House. But despite that, their experience in modding, even as a hobby, was enough to get both Bond and Guthrie hired to Valve. Because at the time, having true industry experience really didn't matter, so long as you had the know-how to do the job. And Steve Bond was largely responsible for the AI of the enemies in Half-Life, an AI system system that was revolutionary for the time period. And there are very many examples of this modder focused hiring strategy from Valve at the time. And this hiring practice was a stroke of genius. If you want people qualified for the job of game development in 1996, then you don't actually need to poach developers from other game companies. Sometimes the best possible hires are those who work on game development in their spare time just for fun. You might also notice that most of the modders that Valve were hiring hiring at the time were modding Quake in particular. Well, there's a very good reason for this. Because Gabe Newell and Mike Harrington had another very important friend that they had met when they worked at Microsoft. And his name was Michael Abrash. Abrash left Microsoft in the mid-90s to go work at id Software, the developers behind the incredibly popular first-person shooter Quake. Using their old friend as a connection, Newell and Harrington flew down to meet the guys at id Software to talk about how to start a games company. But advice on how to start a company wasn't the only thing they got from this meeting. You know, because we were Michael's friends, you know, we walked away with the source code to Quake that day. We had no contract yet. We had kind of an idea of what it could be. And they just gave us a CD and we had kind of the crown jewels of it and, and that you know, game on. This source code was altered massively over the coming years to be turned into Valve's very own gold source engine. The engine that Valve's first title, Half-Life, would be made in. And Half-Life was gonna be big. It was gonna be so big, in fact, that it was going to change the landscape of the games industry forever.
Half-Life released in 1998, and it was a smash hit. It was a massive commercial success, it was praised by critics and audiences alike, and it had officially put Valve's name on the map for good. And its success could largely be chalked up to just how different Half-Life was. Half-Life pioneered a ton of things that rapidly became industry standard in the coming years. The idea that a video game could, like, tell a good story was pretty much unheard of in 1998. Story games were most mostly reserved to things like point and click adventures. There were maybe a couple of exceptions to this, but generally, games weren't made to tell stories. So a game trying to tell a relatively complex story, and a first person shooter doing it at that, was completely groundbreaking. And because the game was story driven, it felt unlike any other game you could play at the time. Even just the opening segment of the game was completely revolutionary. Every single first person shooter at the time started in the exact same way. You plopped the player into a room and they instantly had to start like gunning things down. Maybe there'd be a cutscene before this happened, but usually there wouldn't be. Half-Life changed the pace from this massively. It didn't start out with guns blazing action, it started out like this. A train ride through a facility, with characters and machinery moving around in the background. And to make things even more shocking, this wasn't a pre-rendered cutscene. The player was in control of their character the entire time. From a modern point of view, this seems incredibly trivial. But just to hammer it home, this is 1998 we're talking about. Nobody did any of this before Half-Life. And there's an incredibly noticeable shift in style of first-person shooter games after Half-Life released. So much so that you can quite easily tell apart pre-Half-Life shooter games and post-Half-Life shooter games. It's night and day. Half-Life's release completely changed the game, no pun intended. And without its release, there are countless story-based first-person shooters that would have likely never been made. And even within Valve itself, Half-Life paved the way for every everything that we see from modern Valve. The Source engine is derived from Half-Life's Gold Source engine. Valve's habit of hiring modders started with Half-Life 1. And the new influx of money into the company from this game's commercial success allowed Valve to set their sights on bigger and better projects for the future. Projects that would turn out to be just as revolutionary as the original Half-Life. But we're not talking about that just yet. First, we have to talk about what happened in between. After Half-Life's release, Valve wanted to promote their Half-Life Software Development Kit, or SDK, for modders to start making mods with. They understood full well the power of modders and modding communities, so they wanted to get Half-Life's modding community going as fast as possible. And their method for advertising their SDK was actually quite creative. They looked through Quake's multiplayer servers to find the most popular mods that were being played, and they found a mod called Quake Team Fortress. This mod added nine different playable classes that all had different starting health and starting weapons and special abilities and stuff like that. Valve saw this mod and decided it would be a great way to promote their Half-Life SDK, so they hired the developers of this mod, Robin Walker and John Cook, to come work for Valve and to port Team Fortress into the Gold Source engine. And so Team Fortress Classic was born. Released in 1999, it was meant to show how good the modding tools for Half-Life were, and it definitely succeeded in doing this. Because the success of Team Fortress Classic led to a bunch of mods being made for Half-Life, one of which Valve would be setting their sights upon very quickly. Half-Life Counter-Strike was a mod for Half-Life that released in 1999, and it was very popular, and it had some pretty unique gameplay for the time period too. So in the year 2000, Valve acquired the rights to the mod and the developers of the mod to start start working on an official standalone version of the game that would later become known as Counter-Strike 1.6. And of course, the rest is history, with the most modern version of the game going on to become the most played game on Steam and one of the biggest esports in the world. Both of these games, as well as these ones as a result, owe their entire existence to Valve's hiring of talented modders. Valve has always seen the value in these modding communities, but while Valve was hiring modders, their main dev team was working on something much bigger. But before we get into that, I want to quickly talk to you about something else. Planes. 
Oh my god! This video is sponsored by War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. War Thunder is the most true-to-life vehicle combat game out there, with over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships from 10 major world nations. Everything from armored cars from the 1920s all the way up to fighter jets and battle tanks from the modern day. It's so realistic, in fact, that War Thunder players keep leaking real-life classified military documents about in-game vehicles on the internet because that's dedication to the game right there, baby. That's how you know it's the real deal My personal favorite part about the game is just how detailed everything is incredibly realistic graphics incredibly realistic sound effects They even have hyper realistic damage models and hitboxes for the vehicles too And you can customize your vehicles to no end War Thunder is free to play on PC Xbox and PlayStation And you can sign up using the link in the description to get a massive bonus pack that's available to new players and and returning players. You get the exclusive Eagle of Valor Decorator, 100,000 Silver Lions, and seven days of premium for free when using the link. You even get these cute exclusive festive decals based on Gaijin's snail mascot. All of that for free sounds like a bargain to me, so you should really click that link and check it out. Thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. The sequel to their critically acclaimed industry-changing masterpiece dropped in 2004. Half-Life 2, and it had changed a lot. Firstly, it was written in an entirely new game engine called the Source Engine, the game engine that most of Valve's modern games are created in. This engine is still heavily based on the Quake engine from 1996, but it's been updated and modernized massively to allow tons of brand new things that were revolutionary for the time period. Most notably is Half-Life 2's brand new physics system. Objects could be picked up and thrown around. You could stack objects on top of each other and they would react how you would realistically expect them to. And you could even climb up the stacks of objects that you'd place down. And the main way Valve showed off this revolutionary new tech in their game was with the gravity gun. They'd made this crazy physics system so they gave the player a weapon that specifically uses that system to its maximum potential. You can throw heavy objects at enemies to topple them over and kill them instantly. You can take saw blades and fling them through the torsos of zombies. You can play catch with a robot dog. This is the best part of the game, honestly. And just like in Half-Life 1 with the intro tram ride setting the tone for how different the rest of the game was going to be, Half-Life 2 had similar design decisions made right near the start of the game to show off their new tech, with the most famous moment being this one right here. The NPC knocks a can onto the floor. The game then explicitly tells the player how to throw objects. So most players, of course, throw the can right in the guy's face. This might seem incredibly trivial from a modern point of view, but in 2004, this sort of real-time reactive physics system was completely unheard of. And there's tons of its usage all over the game. Even the enemies use it by kicking explosive barrels down staircases. Well, at least he tries to roll it down the stairs before Gordon Freeman shoots it and blows it up right in his face. Poor guy never knew what hit him, Jesus. And Half-Life 2 was an even bigger commercial success than Half-Life 1 was, completely blowing the original game out of the water. There's no up-to-date sales figures out there for Half-Life 2, but what we do know is that by 2011, Half-Life 2 had sold 12 million copies. Valve was officially a big name in the games industry, and their success was only only just beginning. But after the release of Half-Life 2, Valve was going to change in quite a major way. In late 2004, Valve made some very large internal changes. Changes that were going to shape the company's future dramatically. Before Half-Life 2, Valve had been beholden to publishers, just like most games were at the time. Because digitally downloading a game like you do now was not very common back in the day. Games needed physical releases, a disc in a box that you would go to a shop and buy, and that was the job of the publisher. They produced and distributed physical copies of games and also did some advertising stuff. Now, Sierra Online was Valve's publisher for all of their pre-Half-Life 2 games, and because Valve needed to work with a publisher, then you need to do as they say and you need to meet their deadlines. So you have to be like a normal company that runs under those same restrictions, with some sort of upper management making decisions 
games to force games to ship on certain dates. But after the release and subsequent success of You Know What, Valve suddenly had no need for a real publisher. Suddenly, people were more able to download PC games entirely digitally. So after some lawsuits with Sierra Online, Valve became their own publisher. And their newfound freedom of not needing to meet the demands of a publisher made Valve restructure their entire company. They introduced the infamous Valve Flatland policy. Outside of executive management, employees are now all created equal, with no formal hierarchies whatsoever. If you want to start a project, you're free to do that, and you can go write up a plan for that project and show it to your fellow employees and start a team that will work on it. If you want to go work on an existing project, you can go do that too. Even if it means you're completely dropping the project that you were just working on to go do it. You can just wheel your desk into the appropriate office and start working on the project whenever you want. The goal of this is to make the employees super dedicated because they are constantly working on whatever interests them the most instead of being forced to do work that they don't want to do. And the success of this system and the individual employees within it is measured by peer review meetings that happen every year. With a stack ranking system that measures employee success against other employees to see who's performing the best. This is an incredibly unique system, and we'll talk about some of the downsides of the system later in the video. But the decision to have Valve structured like this changed the company forever, and it meant that the work that was being done, at least in theory, was the work that the worker most wanted to do. And it was shortly after this structural shift that Valve made some of its most famous and influential games. And on October 10th, 2007, Valve would release not one, but three games all in one day, and they would be bundled together in what might just be the single biggest bargain I've ever seen. The Orange Box. First up, we have Portal. Portal started out life as a student project from some people who were at the DigiPen Institute of Technology. These students, on a dev team that called themselves Nuclear Monkey Software, had created a game called Narbacula Drop in 2005. Now, Narbacula doesn't actually mean anything, by the way. It's just a funny word that was made up for the title of the game, apparently with the intention of aiding in search engine optimization or something. But anyway, Narbacula Drop was a super creative game where a little girl character could place portals that would seamlessly connect two places in the game world, and you used this power to solve puzzles throughout the game. The dev team behind the game showed the project at an annual career fair at their university, and Valve's very own Robin Walker saw this game and was incredibly impressed by it. Robin invited Nuclear Monkey Software to show their game to a bunch of senior members at Valve, and Gabe Null himself, after seeing this project, allegedly hired the entire development team on the spot to make a version of the concept for Valve's new and shiny Source engine, and that game would be later known as Portal. This game was an incredibly unique concept, and it had a massive influence on pop culture at the time, and it was massively critically acclaimed. Secondly, we have Half-Life 2 Episode 2. Episode 1 had released in 2006 as a short-form sequel to Half-Life 2 and a year later in 2007, Episode 2 released, which was yet another short-form sequel to continue Gordon's story. Little did we know at the time that this would be the last Half-Life story we would get for a very long time. But the third game released that day was Team Fortress 2, a personal favourite of mine and the sequel to the 1999 game Team Fortress Classic. TF2 had been in development for nine years and had gone through tons of concept changes over its lifetime, starting out as a realistic military shooter, then turning into an asymmetrical multiplayer invasion game, and then ending up as the cartoonish class-based shooter that we know and love today. These three games, as well as Half-Life 2 and Episode 1, released as a bundle called The Orange Box on October 10th, 2007. For the same price tag as one AAA game at the time, you were getting these five games all at once. It sold as physical copies and digital copies, and it's an absolute bargain. And I remember as a kid having a physical copy of the Orange Box, and I played all five of these games to death. I tried to find out how many copies that the Orange Box sold, but I couldn't really find much. All I could find was that by November 2008, it had sold three million copies. And also, this one Destructoid article that says the Orange Box sold more copies 
copies in its first week than Halo 3 did in the same week, which isn't exactly the best metric ever. But bear in mind, this is an impressive stat, since Halo 3 broke all entertainment industry records at the time for how much it was selling. The orange box was a massive milestone for Valve. They had shipped two groundbreaking games and a sequel to another one of their groundbreaking games, and they were willing to bundle it all together for an incredibly low cost. They were showing that they put the consumer first, and this was a big part of their reputation for years to come. And there's perhaps no greater example of Valve's consumer-friendly practice than Valve's biggest and most successful product to date. The thing that has been mysteriously absent in the video so far. Valve are the creators of Steam. Steam is a gargantuan part of Valve's history that I've mostly left out of the video until now, because Steam's success is so enormous, so all-encompassing, that it has to be the final thing I talk about in Valve's rise to dominance. It completely and utterly defines the company in the past and present. Steam started its development in 2002 with humble goals in mind. All the software did was all automatically update Valve games over the internet. Previously, if you wanted to patch a game, you had to host the patch for manual download on the internet. For single player games, that was completely fine, but for multiplayer games, a patch being launched would mean that it would take multiple days for the whole player base to download the patch and get back online and playing again, which would essentially turn off the multiplayer game for about three days. Steam streamlined this process for Valve's own games tremendously. Steam also had automatic anti-cheat and anti-piracy measures that were very useful for multiplayer games at the time. But Steam was about to grow into much more than just a tool to patch games with. Because Valve had conducted user polls in 2002, and they realised that over 75% of their users had access to high-speed internet. So they realised that they could release games to their users way faster over the internet than with regular physical media retail channels. So Steam officially released in 2003, with its primary goal being patching games that were already released. But in 2004, Half-Life 2 released, and it was the very first game to be offered for sale digitally over Steam. No physical copy required. But the real kicker was that anyone who bought the physical copy of Half-Life 2 had to install Steam on their PC to play it. It was a mandatory install, and Half-Life 2 went on to sell millions of copies, 12 million copies by 2011. So it was safe to say that Steam was now downloaded onto millions of PCs of gamers around the world. In 2005, Valve started allowing third-party games to be sold on Steam, and the first ever non-Valve title sold on Steam was apparently Ragdoll Kung Fu. A very strange game, but a piece of Steam history nonetheless. In fact, that's literally what it says on the Steam store page for the game. Anyway, in 2007, after Valve had had even more success with their own games, even more publishers were willing to sell their games on Steam as a platform. And it wasn't just random garbage like Ragdoll Kung Fu either, it was huge publishers, like id Software, Capcom, and Eidos Interactive, who, if you didn't know, were the makers of Tomb Raider and Hitman before they got acquired by Square Enix. By May of 2007, 13 million Steam accounts had been created, with 150 games on sale on the platform. In 2008, even more publishers joined the party. Ubisoft, THQ, Sega, Take-Two Interactive, Activision, EA. The snowball just kept rolling until Steam turned into the enormous publisher that it is today, making ungodly amounts of money. But the reason for all this rapid growth on Steam wasn't some mysterious lightning in a bowl. The reason was actually incredibly simple. Steam was a really good service. It had friends lists and profile pages and a well-organized storefront that is easily searchable. And ease of access was incredibly important too. Being able to download a game digitally was so convenient for PC-only players, and Steam was the only platform offering this for a very long time. And Steam had multiplayer functionality. Steam had its own server systems that people could host on, and they were even built into a lot of games. Even third-party games use Steam servers for their multiplayer functionality. And the biggest kicker of all is that it had all of this functionality years before any other company would even consider it. After Half-Life 
2's release, the only thing causing this rampant growth on Steam was the fact that it was a really, really good service. And now, Steam is the largest gaming platform in the world, and has fully cemented Valve as an industry giant. Steam is so large that it is basically all of Valve at this point. Steam made more money in revenue last year alone than any of their games have ever made. Combined. Probably. Like, we don't have access to up-to-date sales figures of Valve games, so we'll never truly know. Not to mention that sales figures don't tell us whether the game sold for full retail price or for a dollar when it went on sale on Steam. But either way, selling video games makes you millions of dollars. But being the platform that sells other people's games, that makes you billions of dollars. And the difference between a million dollars and a billion dollars is roughly a billion dollars. And bear in mind, this nine billion figure doesn't include the community market, nor does it include microtransactions that Valve takes a cut of. Steam is so unbelievably large that any of their other projects just pale in comparison from a business standpoint. So much so that basically none of Valve's decisions in the modern day are based on profit. Because as long as Steam keeps growing, whatever games or hardware they personally release in the future will barely even be a blip on Valve's radar compared to the amount of money Steam rakes in in just one year. And this is where we have to talk about what some consider to be the downfall of Valve as a company. Now, this downfall is, of course, not really much of a downfall at all. Not from a business perspective, anyway. Like I said, Steam makes billions every year. Valve is not falling in any measure that they care about. But despite that, the title of this video isn't quite clickbait, because the company isn't literally falling. But the fall is instead a symbolic one. A fall from grace. A fall in the eyes of their fans and their communities. Because Valve has changed in more recent years. And in the eyes of many of their fans, they've changed for the worse. So let's just pick the low-hanging fruit then, shall we? Team Fortress 2 is one of Valve's most beloved titles, an over 16-year-old game with a player base that would make most developers blush. But in the eyes of Valve, this player number is nothing. And and TF2 has been under attack in recent years. And I mean literally under attack. A bunch of losers on the internet making hundreds if not thousands of bot accounts that cheat in Valve's oldest multiplayer title that's still left standing. The problem is so bad that if you use Valve's very own in-game matchmaking cues to find a game of Team Fortress 2, there's a 50% chance that the game you'll find will be literally unplayable. Completely infested with spin botting snipers on completely unmanned Steam accounts that are automated to do this 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. This has been going on for years now. Ever since 2019, this has been ongoing. And Valve has done very little to fix this. And the very few things Valve has done to fix this aren't exactly desirable. In fact, to prevent the bots from spamming the mic in-game, Valve turned off all free-to-play players' ability to type in chat and use the microphone, which does nothing except hurt real players who are playing Team Fortress 2 for the first time. Because the bots, they don't care. They just buy premium and spam the mic anyway. So the only people this change hurts are people who actually really like Team Fortress 2. Now you might be wondering, but H2, Valve has an anti-cheat system. It's called VAC, or Valve Anti-Cheat, and VAC auto bans people who cheat. So how do these bots even exist? if all of these servers are VAC secured? Well, dear viewer, let me explain it to you. Valve anti-cheat sucks. Like, it, it really sucks. It's a very, very old piece of software. It started its development all the way back in 2002 with the initial development of Steam, intending to stop people from cheating in the original Counter-Strike. And VAC has been updated since then, so it's not completely useless, but to call it outdated would be a tremendous understatement. But this isn't actually the reason the bots are able to exist. The bots actually do get detected by Valve's anti-cheat. 
Yoshi. And they get banned en masse literally all the time. But there's a built-in feature of VAC that makes botting in particular a very difficult type of cheating for Valve's anti-cheat to prevent. When VAC detects a cheat on your computer, it waits a little while, maybe two days, maybe a week, before it actually bans you for that cheat. The reason it does this is so that you don't quite know which cheat you downloaded that got you banned. Because a lot of people who cheat typically install lots of types of cheat software, and they don't want cheat manufacturers to find out that VAC can detect their cheat easily. And this is actually a really good system at banning human players who use cheats, but it has a pretty obvious and major flaw when dealing with bots. If a bot gets detected by VAC and it takes two days for that bot to get banned, then that's two days where that bot is infesting TF2 casual and ruining everyone's fun. An individual cheater taking days to be banned is just fine, but thousands of bots all being left active for multiple days at a time is terrible for the game's community. And when a bot gets banned, the bot maker just makes a new bot in its place and uses the exact same cheats to power those bots for all eternity. And as long as the bot makers are willing to keep them running, this issue will literally never end without Valve's direct intervention, which is something that Valve either can't or won't do. But honestly, if I had to guess, I'd imagine it's more like can't and won't do. Like, Valve's employees don't want to spend the time fixing this problem. And even if they did, it'd be a lot more intensive than the community probably realises. Remember how we talked about Valve's internal structure earlier in the video? That whole Valve Flatland scheme where their employees get to choose what to work on? Well, this right here is one of the major downsides to that system. Because employees get to self-allocate the tasks that they will be doing from day to day. So why would a talented game dev choose to optionally work on a 16 and a half year old game with a tremendous botting problem that they might not even be able to fix when they can go work on revolutionary VR technology in the office two doors down the hall. There is zero incentive for any Valve employee to try and help TF2 with its botting problem. In fact, there's even reasons why they should actively avoid helping TF2. Because there is a chance that fixing this botting issue won't be possible with the limited resources that Valve is willing to allocate to TF2. So if you spend a bunch of time trying to fix the issue, maybe you'll succeed and maybe you'll look like a hero. But there's a very large chance that you will fail at doing this. And then you'll have to go into your peer review meeting and explain that you spent weeks or even months trying to hashtag save TF2 and you failed and you have nothing Thing to show for it. That's not going to make you look like a valuable asset to the company now, is it? And since we're on the topic of Valve Flatland, let's dig a little bit deeper into some of its other issues. Most notably is that the idea of Valve being Flatland, where everyone's voice is equal, is actually a complete lie anyway. Formal hierarchies with managers and stuff is completely gone. But that doesn't mean everyone's equal. It just means that complex social hierarchies replace formal ones. Instead of a manager, you have a longtime employee who's worked at Valve for decades, and they have tons of social clout. So when they talk, they get listened to. And if they suggest a project, it's way more likely to get done than if a brand new hire suggests it. So it's not like Valve is actually flatland at all. It's just that they try to be, and they inadvertently replace formal management with social cliques that dominate the workplace. And there's tons of problems that this cause that I won't really go and get into. But from a consumer's perspective, the biggest issue that this causes is quite a frustrating one. Cancelled projects. There have been so many cancelled Valve projects that will never see the light of day. Too many to even count. And Valve's flatland structure is the primary cause of these projects going under. Executive management, the only people who are truly the higher ups, don't want to step in and demand that devs finish their projects. Because that would go against the flatland policy that the executive management thinks is a good idea. So if internal bickering kills a project, then the project dies. And 
nobody even tries to come and save it. The most notable example of this is probably Left 4 Dead 3. There were lots of screenshots from Left 4 Dead 3's development leaked all over the internet, and according to many sources, Left 4 Dead 3 was relatively close to being completely finished, only needing, you know, 10 to 12 months of development before being shippable. But it got cancelled when the developers couldn't decide on what engine to ship the game in. The development team had been working on the game in Source 2 for quite a while, but some of the other devs thought that Source 2 wasn't going to be up to snuff for a very long time, and they wanted to port their work into Unreal Engine so that they could release the game sooner. And this caused so much internal conflict on the project that it got cancelled seemingly indefinitely, and will likely never see the light of day. Now, there are quite a lot of sources for this information out there, but I can't personally verify them because I don't you know, work for Valve. So do try and take this with a slight pinch of salt, since this information is based on leaks and private conversations people had with Valve employees. But still, this is the alleged fate of Left 4 Dead 3, and it's also the fate of many Valve projects. Half-Life games that never got released, some of which were actually third-party games being made by people like Gearbox. And quite frankly, the leaked projects that got cancelled that the public actually knows about is probably probably just the tip of the iceberg on just how many projects have actually been cancelled at Valve. And in 2020, after the release of Half-Life Alex, Valve actually admitted that the Flatland structure had caused them some problems. They acknowledged that their internal structure had slowed their output during the 2010s. Here's a direct quote from Robin Walker. We sort of had to collectively admit that we were wrong on the premise that you will be the happiest if you work on something you personally want to work on the most. In a normal company, some sort of higher up would step in and resolve the conflict on the project and force it to get finished in one way or another, as to not waste years of hard work from dozens of employees. But at Valve, nobody is able to do that. And this is also why Valve is so quiet about things. They don't really make any public announcements because they never truly know whether a project will get finished until it's already over the finish line. And in the past, when Valve has announced things, they very frequently disappointed, and in fact, oftentimes the public announcements come from the man himself. The main thing that we're uh, working on right now after we get the orange box out the door is going to be episode three. After orange box, we have to get episode three out. Our plan for Half-Life is to get through these three episodes. We are at the midpoint in our trilogy of episodes, which will conclude in episode three. Gabe Newell is the CEO of Valve, but he's not just that. He's actually much more than that. He's also a figurehead. He's a famous figure at the company that people will listen to, but he's not been an active developer at Valve in years. He's not been a part of any development projects for a very long time. So there's actually plenty of devs at Valve that would likely be far more qualified to go to events and interviews and talk about specific projects, but it wouldn't make as much of a splash as it would if Gabe himself said it. So that's why Gabe is the guy saying all of these things. But because he's not working on any project personally, it means that when he does go to an event or an interview, he sort of just says stuff. Is it not of any major update for Team Fortress 2? Yes, we have updates for Team Fortress 2. Okay, because we're aware of the ongoing crisis. Oh yeah, we're very, very aware of the problem in our ship. I think we have good solutions for it. Like, he'll just say whatever was convenient at the time, regardless of whether it's actually true or not. Seemingly, he does this for a few reasons. Reason one is that he wants to create hype so that certain employees in the company feel pressured into doing things that he wants them to do. Reason two is that he doesn't want to say something negative in an interview. So he just lies to avoid the bad publicity and to not upset the community or the interviewer in the moment. And reason number three is that he feels like it? I guess, I mean, it's hard to say conclusively why he does this, but there are countless examples of him doing it over the years. But we're not quite done talking about Gabe, because Gabe Null has unsurprisingly had a massive effect on the trajectory of Valve as a whole, on account of, you know, being the CEO of the company. But his effects haven't always been positive, and I think the best place to see that is what's been happening recently to Steam. Something you might not know about Gabe is that he 
he's a massive libertarian, and he has what you might call a free speech absolutist view of things. And here is an interesting account from a former Valve employee that shows off exactly what I'm talking about. At Valve, at least at the time of this account, they had meetings every few weeks where they'd go through all the games that had been flagged as potentially inappropriate for Steam, and they needed to be manually reviewed as to whether or not they should be allowed on the platform. One time, Gabe Null personally sat in on one of these meetings, and he made some very, very bold takes about content moderation. He said that Valve should not restrict anything coming to Steam so long as it wasn't illegal. He said if he owned a video store, he wouldn't want to stock The Sopranos because he thinks The Sopranos is bad. So even though he didn't personally like it and he felt like it had no societal value, it shouldn't be banned and they should stock it anyway because it's a very popular TV show. This is Gabe's stance on content moderation on Steam. And as much as that story is the account of a former Valve employee, if you look at Steam's content moderation, it seems like it all rings true. Steam in 2023 added almost 15,000 new games onto the platform. This is more games than you could ever play in your entire lifetime. And the overwhelming majority of them are completely harmless, sure, but not all of them. In fact, I've personally made multiple videos now about some of the complete drivel that is on Steam. Whether it be dumb booby games or games that are completely stolen asset flips that are republished onto Steam for a profit. But even beyond that, Valve hosts games like this one called Prison, which if you take just one read of the bio, any sane content moderation team would have banned this in an instant. But at the time of writing, it's still on Steam and it has a bunch of negative reviews, but all of these reviews are about how it's a bad game and not about the absolutely horrific content that's inside of said game. There's also racist games on Steam. Very, very many racist games. None of which are exactly comparable to the fucking Sopranos, Gabe Null. This story from this Valve employee is quite old by now, but Gabe's free speech absolutism still clearly flourishes on Steam, even to this day. But it can also be seen in Valve's recent announcement about games that feature AI on Steam. Steam has formally been banning games that used AI-generated content, mostly AI-generated art, because the copyright law surrounding AI was incredibly shaky. But after allegedly doing a ton of research behind the scenes, Valve has unsurprisingly decided that AI-generated content is A-OK -okay for games on Steam. So long as the developer admits that the game features AI art and clarifies whether it's pre-generated art or if the game itself can generate art. Dumb Indie Games 3000 style shovelware garbage is already insanely common on Steam, and this change is no doubt going to make it 10 times more common than it already was. Not to mention that you're already relying on the good faith of devs to admit that they use AI generated assets, because nobody would ever lie about something like that, would they Gabe? And I'd say that maybe a content moderation team would catch people lying about it, but Valve's content moderation on Steam is already completely terrible, so that's, you know, pretty unlikely. So if users don't catch it and report it themselves, who knows how many games will have AI art in them without even disclosing it to Valve at all. Now, to be fair to Valve just for a moment, them accepting AI generated content on Steam sort of had to be done, as much as I hate to say that. Simply because the AI content storm is already happening, and games have already been doing it whether Valve likes it or not. Things like The Finals, a game that uses AI generated announcer voices to cut costs on voice actors. Valve is definitely opening the floodgates with this AI change, but the floodgates were already bursting at the seams to begin with. So as much as it's incredibly predictable that Valve would make this decision, perhaps Valve didn't realistically have much of a say on the matter in the grand scheme of things to begin with. But this AI news isn't the only disappointing news to come out of Valve in the last few weeks, because Valve recently did something quite controversial that has people very, very upset. But there's also been a ton of misinformation surrounding these recent events, so I'm gonna try and actually set the record straight on it here. There was a mod team working on a little game called Portal 64. It was gonna be a demake of Portal that would run on Nintendo 64 hardware and software. Valve contacted this mod team and advised them to stop working on the mod. Valve did not send any form of legal takedown notice to the team whatsoever. They just advised them to shut down the project. The reason for this is because 
because Portal 64's team was using copyrighted content from another company. Nintendo. And Nintendo love throwing the whole strength of the law at people for even looking at Nintendo's copyrighted material in the wrong way. The mod team was using Nintendo's very own assets and software libraries to make their mod, and Valve was warning the mod team that the use of this would likely attract the attention of Nintendo at some point in the future. And the modding team took this advice and stopped working on the mod entirely. But in the heat of the moment, the wider community heard about this story and twisted it into something it wasn't. Valve advising a mod team to avoid legal trouble with Nintendo is actually Valve doing modders a favour. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they're probably doing it mostly to save their own backs because they don't want to get caught up in a lawsuit about it, but still, they're doing the mod team a favour by warning them preemptively like this instead of just allowing them to get attacked by Nintendo. But people who weren't quite in the know interpreted this situation slightly differently. Valve took down a portal mod personally. That's what the community thinks happened, which is just not what happened at all. But there's another very similar situation that's gotten people a little more angry, and perhaps a little more rightfully so. Team Fortress Source 2 was a project that was being heavily worked on by a modding team for a game called Sandbox. Sandbox is, to put it simply, the sequel to Gary's Mod. Gary's Mod was a source game where users could make their very own games inside the source engine. Sandbox is that exact same thing, but for Source 2. And the titular Gary Newman, the man behind Gary's mod, is also the man behind Sandbox. Sandbox is still in closed beta, but some people who had access to that beta were making a complete remake of Team Fortress 2 in Sandbox, which means it was just Team Fortress 2 ported wholesale into Source 2. Valve recently sent a DMCA takedown to TF2 Source 2's GitHub page. The official reason given was that it was using Valve's official official assets to make the mod. But chances are, even if they were using completely custom assets, Valve would have probably found a reason to DMCA it anyway. Now, this too has caused quite a lot of commotion in the wider Valve community. But to be honest, I think people are mad at Valve for the wrong reasons here. In fact, I think Gary Newman himself puts it best in this tweet here. While it's maybe out of character for Valve to take down fan projects like this, it's hardly surprising when you have their entire game up uploaded. I somehow don't think old Valve would have let anyone port Half-Life to another engine and host it publicly either. TF2 Source 2 is a direct port of TF2. It's not a mod, it's not a different game mode or anything, it's straight up Team Fortress 2 recreated in a different engine. Valve is of course well within their right to take down anything that uses their IP, but in this case they're actually very justified in doing so. The original Gary's mod had a bunch of Valve characters in it it, not because it was a Valve made game, but because Gary Newman had a licensing deal for those characters to be used. Sandbox has no such deal with Valve, so the use of Valve characters is way more sketchy in Sandbox. But even outside of that, it's just a market replacement for TF2 being hosted for free on the internet outside of Valve's control. It's not surprising, nor is it unreasonable, that Valve took down this TF2 port, and honestly, people shouldn't be mad at Valve for doing it. The thing that people should be mad at Valve for is for taking down a port of Team Fortress 2 whilst the real actual video game Team Fortress 2 is being attacked by bots and cheaters for almost five years now. That's why people should be mad at this. Them taking down the Source 2 port is incredibly justified, but not when they leave the actual game that they actually do have control over to rot despite its large player base. Not to mention that many people have allegedly asked Valve for a Source 2 software development kit, and Valve has consistently declined, going far as to say to some people to just use Sandbox. And then when people do just use Sandbox, they get DMCA'd for it. Valve has mishandled this situation in a very large way, and people have every right to be mad about it. It just seems like when you scroll through social media posts about the situation, people are mad at it for all of the wrong reasons. And if people want to be mad at Valve for attacking perfectly harmless mods, then you don't have to 
look at TF2 Source 2, you can look no further than Team Fortress 2 VR. Now, I can't actually show footage of this game in the video, and I'll explain why a little bit later. So regular TF2 footage is gonna have to suffice for a little while. TF2 VR was a mod for a game called Contractors VR. Contractors has such good modding tools that people literally recreated the entirety of 2007 TF2 with every class except Spy and had it fully functioning in virtual reality. Valve didn't DMCA take down this mod per se, but what they did do is send copyright strikes to YouTubers who were talking about it or showing gameplay of it. Hence why I can't really risk showing footage of it here. Nobody is 100% sure why Valve did this and verifying any story is hard. So take all of this with a massive pinch of salt. But here's the leading theory. Apparently Valve hired some new legal teams recently and the theory goes that someone at Valve told this legal team to take down TF2 VR and the way they told them this is by showing them videos of the game being played. The lawyers then misinterpreted the request and sent DMCAs to the YouTube videos themselves instead of the actual mod. So the videos got DMCA'd but the project itself did not. But even though the project wasn't directly taken down, these DMCA's to YouTube videos were enough to scare the team behind the mod into completely halting development and removing the mod from download entirely. So despite the unusual methodology, Valve took down this mod. Now this game is also just a direct port of TF2, but it's a port into VR, not just some other engine. And VR completely changes the way the game is played. So this one, at least in my opinion, is a whole lot less justified to take down than a Source 2 port. Yet this example seemingly made a much smaller splash in the community for some reason. But no matter how you look at it, these three examples show a pretty massive change of heart from Valve. Even if justified, it's incredibly out of character for them to attack modders like this. In fact, Valve has a storied history of working directly with modders in a way that no other company has ever really had. Even so much as to say that the company wouldn't have made it out of the 90s without talented modders on their payroll. But all of this stuff raises a pretty good question. Why has Valve changed? Why is the company so different now compared to the Valve that we grew up with in the early 2000s? Well, I think there's two major reasons for this. One big reason and one really big reason. The big reason is Valve's flatland structure because the sad reality of this utopian system is that some jobs that need doing that are incredibly important to the company are not jobs that are desirable to do. People don't want to do these things, but in the end, they have to be done. And in fear of losing their job in a peer review meeting, nobody wants to be the lone dev trying and failing to fix vital problems that nobody else is willing to touch. So they work on more desirable projects that are not only much more interesting to work on, but are also less risky to work on because their value to the company is much more obvious and easily explainable in a peer review meeting. But the really, really big reason for Valve's downfall, the gargantuan elephant in the room here, is is Steam. Steam's success has been so large, so unprecedented, that it has changed Valve in an incredibly drastic way. And from a business perspective, it's changed for the better. Valve is making more money than ever, and it allows the company to work on literally whatever they want, with no financial barricade whatsoever. Valve has always had an eye for revolution. They want to make things that are unique and different and might change the world one day. Even way back when they were making the original Half-Life, they weren't just trying to make a Quake clone, they were making something that hadn't been done before. And Valve is still driven by those same factors now, but Steam's influx of cash has changed the focus of the company from games to services and hardware, a change that has made fans of traditional Valve, who grew up in the days of frequent Valve game releases, quite upset. Valve has more money than God now, and they use it to create revolutionary VR technology and super-powered handheld computers. Gabe Null has even gone on record himself talking about how he wants to make brain computer interfaces so that you can play games inside of your own mind. Valve wants to innovate and they have no interest in innovating in game design anymore because with the amount of money they rake in, game design is small fry compared to the big game that they're trying to hunt. So that, at least in my opinion, is what has changed Valve. In the eyes of business, they've changed for the better, but in the eyes of their longest standing fans, they've changed for nothing but the worse. 
So that was our journey through the history of Valve and why they've changed so greatly over the years. Oh, and also don't forget planes. Don't forget about this video's sponsor, War Thunder. It's completely free. It's available on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. And if you use my link, you can get all that awesome free stuff I mentioned earlier. Go blow up some tanks for free in the comfort of your own home with War Thunder. Valve's change over the years has been a slow and steady one, slowly evolving into a brand new company. But Valve has shown signs of self-reflection from time to time, even admitting in 2020 that their flatland structure had slowed their output in the 2010s. So maybe it's not all doom and gloom. We'll just have to wait and see what Valve has in store for us in the near and distant future. Thanks for watching.